Uh, one was that uh, Japan is clearly militarizing again, um, out of many decades of not doing so. In part, it's doing that at the behest of the collective West, but at the same time, it's doing it because it is exploring, my assessment anyway, this is my opinion, uh, is that it is exploring how far it can take advantage of relative American weakness in the region. It's stretched a long way, remember, it's stretched very thin to just stretch its own wings out. This is Japan I'm talking about um, as part of a remilitarization and to begin to see whether it can uh, break free a little of some of the post-war shackles uh, that the Americans have put on them. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have with me again Warwick Powell, who is an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and he's also a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, a non-governmental international think tank based in Beijing. Warwick, uh, Warwick agreed to join me again to discuss the most recent uh, trilateral summit that happened between Japan, South Korea and China, and also part of his trip that he did to Beijing recently. Um, I think both um, what's happening what's happening in the political uh, discourse in China right now, as well as the summit, they all deserve more attention than they actually than they're actually getting, especially that summit, which gives us quite a bit of clues of how the Pacific is trying to structure its, its relationship. Um, Warwick, thank you very much for coming on online today. Great to be with you again, Pascal. Well, we, uh, just before we started the recording, you were saying that you're coming back from Beijing and that uh, people are people are confused. Could you expand on that? Yeah, look, I've just spent the last week in Beijing meeting with folk in government, in research institutions, think tanks, and also entrepreneurs, and also people from different walks of life, um, Chinese folk, um, Americans in China, Scandinavians in China, Australians in China, and they're all scratching their heads, wondering where and when the collective West seems to have lost its ability to reason. And, uh, and the evidence, I guess, that's being pointed to consistently is decisions that go towards intensifying conflicts rather than trying to find uh, off ramps for everybody involved, trying to resolve issues through negotiations and diplomacy. But instead, the collective West seems to be upping the ante um, on everything. Uh, in, and in many regards, uh, in ways that are quite clearly harmful to the collective West's own interests. This is like one of the common themes now for me for the past months, if not if not a year, that we are going through a huge crisis of realism because a lot of the stuff that we are seeing right now, especially this escalation in Europe, makes a little bit of sense for the for the United States, but it makes zero sense for the Europeans. Like this is so dangerous. And it, the way that also that the collective West seems to confront at the moment everybody in this friend friend and enemy scheme makes zero sense as, as if though you couldn't actually have beneficial relationships on some level while 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 competing in other levels, which used to be the past thirty years, right, of the post Cold War era. Uh, there used to be a consensus that, especially with China, you can compete in one level and, and you can cooperate in, in, in others. And all of this seems to go out of the window. So uh, people in China, do they are they trying to make sense out of this somehow? Yeah, look, trying to understand irrationality or trying to understand how different rationalities come into play is the one of the big challenges of our current period. There was a time where you could probably work within a relatively narrow range of rationality parameters to anticipate how others might react to different things. But right now, it's clear that the instinct, the first instinct of the collective Western powers is to go kinetic first. So whenever there's an issue, the move is to um, threaten um, some kind of military intervention and, and then worry about what happens thereafter. And in fact, we've seen this happen now in not only the debacle in Ukraine, but also in West Asia, where uh, the, 
the full embrace, if you will, of Benjamin Netanyahu uh, right at the outset of this current phase of the the conflict essentially gave Israel a blank check to pursue a kinetic first and a kinetic only approach to addressing uh, what they believe are their issues and interests. And as events have unfolded, people are literally wondering how it is that we can recreate conditions that can at least bring a temporary halt to the violence and the death and destruction and at least bring a modicum of stability back into the situation. And they're the challenges right now, Pascal, and um, there is a lot of head scratching, definitely. This is it's really hard to see how how we could get to a more stable situation, especially in West Asia. I mean, on the one hand, okay, the US actually de-escalated the conflict with uh with Iran, which uh Israel was like doing everything in its power to actually get a, a bigger war. And it seems that the US and Iran were the were the stakeholders that said, like, no, enough is enough. We're not gonna go there. On the other hand, we now have a, a situation where almost 300 Palestinians were killed for the rescue of four hostages, and a couple of hostages were killed in that uh in that situation as well. And we we are learning that the the humanitarian pier that the U.S. constructed was partially used for that and that U.S. troops were actively involved in this onslaught, which is like a breach of international law on so many levels, you know, international humanitarian law, so, so many proportionality, uh, 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 non-combatant discrimination, so, so many. And um, it's just getting clearer and clearer that this is a is is a. A, a U.S. Israeli project, and whatever is happening on the international scene with like the U.S. like uh, bringing out certain certain propositions are not meant to be real. <laughs> They're not meant to bring about a ceasefire. Um, this is diplomatic coverage, and this is becoming obvious to the to the entire world community. Now, if that's happening, then how do I mean? How would other players like China actually interact with such a blatantly, obviously uncamouflaged, lying West? Um, what You need new strategies to interact with that thing, don't you? A credibility deficit is definitely the foundational state of play at the moment. And as you mentioned, moves at institutions such as the Security Council level have simply been fig leaves to cover up actions on the ground. The fact that only a few weeks ago, a resolution of the, of the United Nations Security Council, which passed through, was then in effect undermined by the United States saying that um, th that particular resolution was non-binding. It basically destroyed the credibility of the, of the Security Council's capability to impose um, anything going forward. And, and I think that having done that, this, this latest of resolutions that got through um, has literally been seen in that light, particularly when within 24 hours, the Israel Prime Minister uh, responded by saying, we're going to keep going anyway. And, um, and this is where we're at again. You know, this is a, this is a credibility problem. The collective West uh, has pursued approaches that, are not only hypocritical and bring double standards to the table, but actually have a long history now of not working. And what I think is interesting coming out of the situation in Gaza and West Asia generally is that the Arab states have agreed to seek an international conference to attempt to, in a sense, go around the limitations of the United Nations and the UNSC and bring some critical mass together that may create the conditions where, and I won't say a peace can be negotiated, but where the parties can be brought to the table. The situation is so bad that the combatants, if you will, will find it very difficult to engage with each other in good faith. And there's going to be a lot of work that's going to have to be done before you even get to the starting point. But there is an international effort, particularly coming from the Arab states, working with Russia, China and others to at least create an environment where that may be possible.
Yeah, and I think it's also important to recognize that the only like diplomatic efforts that actually deserved the name um, that were actually aimed at bringing an end or or at least getting somewhere where negotiations can can begin uh, came from uh, West Asia themselves, Qatar and Oman. These are very uh, pivotal states in order to get diplomacy going. And you also have uh, some uh, back channel diplomacy going on um, uh, through, I, I believe, also through through Russia to to to. OK, I'll take that back. I'm not sure. But Qatar and Oman, I know. Um, uh, so those are states, uh, and I think what we are seeing is again that the the post World War II order that used to basically that that used to govern the the relationship between at least the the Western bloc at the time, but to a certain extent also with, also with the Soviet Union, that then became the entirety of the, the the world system we had for 30 years is crumbling because its main proponent, the, 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 the state that built it, the US, is actually withdrawing and using its all its force to kind of to tear this system down. As you said, the, the Security Council, if you as the United States claim that a Security Council resolution is not binding, well, you are using a, a sledgehammer in order to take down the, the authority of the Security Council. Um, let's use this and shift it a little bit to East Asia, because it seems to me that the only hope I have is in other actors and other other participants and how they interact with each other, leaving out the US, right? And um, we see that in East Asia, it, it seems to me that, that uh, you know, Korea and Japan are clearly in cahoots with the US to a large, to a large extent in a, in, a, in, in a lot of areas. But I would not today, I would not categorize them anymore as being part of the collective West, the way Europe is part of the collective West. South Korea and Japan seem to act differently from Europe. Um, what's your impression? Look, I think it's important to perhaps understand how these other states and other regions are observing what's happening in West Asia and in Europe. And not only are they scratching their heads at the apparent irrationality of the approaches of the collective West, but they're actually drawing some very concrete lessons from the experiences to date. And some of those lessons include the fact that a kinetic first approach to conflict resolution actually is a case of adding fuel to the fire rather than finding a pathway to some kind of settlement. So I think what we're starting to see is a realization that a particular style of let's call it international governance to use as diplomatic a phrase as I can think of, uh, but, but, a, but, a, but a style that has relied upon a kinetic first military driven approach to issues resolution is simply not working. You can't impose solutions at the end of a gun into areas and think that these so-called solutions will stick. Clearly they don't. And what that means is that I think actors everywhere are starting to realise that the only way in which solutions to contentious and difficult issues that have often plagued areas and regions and by bilateral relationships for possibly decades, if not longer, can only be addressed in an environment where consensus solutions are built. You have to build them bottom up. And that's a style question as much as as a mentality question, right? So you've got to build them from bottom up. The, the impacted parties actually need to buy into the solution, not just be told what the solution is. And that requires an approach that acknowledges that others' interests are actually legitimate, that they are respected, and that through mutual respect, you don't have to agree on everything, but you have to respect that the others have got genuine interests, then you've got a chance of working your way towards a consensus. I yeah, think that that's, that's what's going on. Yeah, but that's the thing. That's not the goal. From the US and collective West side, that's not the goal. The goal is kinetic first, as you as you correctly outlined. The goal is to go in with military force. And the rest is just camouflage in order to pretend toward your own population that you've tried everything. You know, we tried everything except 
uh, talking to our counterparts, except making an agreement, except actually negotiating. But we've done everything. And so this is like pl purely meant, the narrative we hear in the media is purely meant for propagandizing your own population. While on the other hand, the goal seems to be kinetic first. And the reason why I would like to talk about East Asia is because we have seen something that a bit surprised me, which is this trilateral summit between uh, China, the the Japan and uh, South Korea on on the highest level. I mean, on the Chinese side, it wasn't Xi Jinping, but it was the 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 prime minister. I mean, this is they are not exactly co-equal, but they are you know it's the closest you can get on 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 the Chinese side. Um, and they came up with an outcome document, which surprised me because it's really long. <laughs> it's eight pages yeah. long, and they all signed this, and they all they laid out a couple of of rules of engagement that they that they want to have, and and actually a very positive document that talks a lot about about engagement and even talks about uh, uh, creating more economic ties, uh, which runs counter to what we have seen the 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 the, es the the constant escalation between the EU and Russia, which which at the end the EU just clearly perceived. Uh, I, I mean, um, even told Ukraine, you have to choose association agreement with us or with Ru with Russia. Um, and it seems to me that Japan and Korea are not are not do not want to approach China in in that way and are also now building again uh, new um, diplomatic pathways to 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 actually be constructive with China. Is that is that a fair assessment? I think that that's a large part of the truth. I think that um, North East Asia and Northeast Asia are historically very complex places, as I'm sure you, you, you're aware of. The relationships between uh, the peoples of the Korean Peninsula um, before the war and after the war, Japan and China have been you know, complex and at times quite fraught. But at the same time, for many centuries, there have also been significant economic, social and cultural intercourse between these nations or these civilizations, if you will. I think what's going on in East Asia is, as I mentioned, firstly, a realization that there are approaches to problems that actually don't work. You know, that that's a that's a realizational issue. Now, different states in different parts of the world will have constraints as to the extent to which they can move towards a more consensus-driven approach and how they do that, particularly given the preponderance of American military power in East Asia built up over the last seven decades and the ongoing military presence of US forces on the Korean Peninsula and in Japan itself. So before touching on the trilateral agreement, the other thing to bear in mind, and these are some of the complexities in the region that we need to be mindful of, is that particularly Japan, has some views concerning um, what goes on with some islands uh, that it is in dispute with China over. It also has some views in relation to the island of Taiwan, which um, is, is potentially a focal point of, um, of conflict. Uh, so that's, that's one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we need, just need to keep in the back of our mind. The second interesting thing is, is that before this trilateral took place, um, Japan's Prime Minister Kishida was actually in Washington on another trilateral, which was with uh, the United States and the Philippines. And that went to, I think, a couple of uh, things. Uh, one was that uh, Japan is clearly militarizing, again, um, out of many decades of not doing so. In part, it's doing that at the behest of the collective West, but at the same time, it's doing it because it is exploring my assessment anyway, this is my opinion, uh, is that it is exploring how far it can take advantage of relative American weakness in the region. It's stretched a long way, remember, it's stretched very thin to just stretch its own wings out. This is Japan I'm talking about um, as part of a remilitarization and to begin to see whether it can uh, break free a little of some of the post-war shackles uh, that the Americans have put on them. Now, that could play in many, many different directions, and it's impossible to predict. But one of the things that I think it has done is that it's also intersected with a Japanese economic policy that realises that it can't disentangle itself from the economic relationships that it has with China and with Korea, in the short term, but also in the long term, there are there are other opportunities, if you will, in that region. And the opportunities 
are already apparent from the Japanese experience where they have to have the gas deals with the Russians. You know, that's that's something the Sakhalin 2 deals. Um, they haven't changed since the outbreak of conflict in Ukraine. In fact, Japan asked for special dispensation from the G7 to not um, sanction that particular project because Japan needs the energy. That's the first thing. But the second thing that I think is interesting is what's happening in in the far east of Russia. And that's what's going on in Siberia and the interconnections that are opening up there with uh, the DPRK and with China itself. Now, all of these dynamics are transforming the potential economic configurations of that part of the world, opening up actually new opportunities for Japan um, and all those in the Korean Peninsula to have a different economic orientation. So a lot of fluidity at the moment, Pascal, I think. That, 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 that is absolutely true. I mean, the change that's happening over here is now greater than any point in the last 30 years, I would, I, I, I would say. A, a lot of people forget that Russia and North Korea do have a land border. Uh, they they have direct access to each other, and um, the fact that there's that there's high level talks going on between North Korea and uh, and and Russia might also mean very much something on the economic level. And the uh, what you just outlined about Japan and its security, I also believe is is right. I have witnessed uh, discussions, several ones between Japanese uh, uh, security. Uh, um, well, thinkers and you know people who are connected to the to 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 government. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, to different parts. I mean, the Japanese government is actually you know it's 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 very it's splintered into the different ministries, and the ministries among themselves are not always on the on 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 the same uh, on the same page. So it's it's very it's it's very splintered. But the, the one thing about the system is it takes into account what what other people also at universities and think tanks and so and so on think, and there it goes back and forth. So it's quite interesting how the how decision making works here. But one of the things is that you have two camps. One camp that clearly sees this new new remilitarization as in the in the service of a stronger US Japan uh, alliance and then you have another camp that sees it more in the in terms of a more uh, capability on your own if push comes to shove we have to be able even if the US withdraws its umbrella and so on we have to be able to care for ourselves and these two are not against each other they work in tandem together and and i think what you're outlining is is right and this is why it's also interesting that this outcome document of the trilateral summit yeah. actually contained a part on security it didn't talk about Taiwan at all. It didn't talk about the islands, so it left out all of the contentious parts, and it it focused on what the three can agree on. Uh, one is that they want a stable Korea, which is good. It's good to hear. It's like no 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 uh, interest in escalation. And another one is that all three say like we are stakeholders and have responsibilities towards a stable um, Pacific region. Yeah. And that's what we are aiming for, which is a very positive way of. I mean, I never hear this kind of positive rhetoric coming from the U.S. or coming from the from the uh, from the EU. For them, it's always like China is rising. This is a threat. We need to we need to uh, uh, confront the the threat uh, head on and so on. And here we have an outcome document that says like, no, we are equal partners, and we have to make sure that things stay stable. Yeah. Look, I think that there's um, an interesting emerging distinction between. I guess what some scholars would call a negative piece, which is simply the absence of direct live military conflict and what they would then call a positive piece. And a positive piece really goes much deeper and broader to why we have peace, and that is to enable and to sustain economic development, um, greater balance within regions and between countries in terms of their economic relationships, and all of that feeds into, I guess, a virtuous cycle of stabilization because the more stable a region is, the more balanced it is economically, the greater the economic prospects are for each country, which then makes their political situation domestically more stable, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's actually a realization um, that you see not explicitly in the communique, but implicitly in it. The other thing I think we have in terms of the situation concerning a stable uh, Korean peninsula is a recognition that 
there has been some change in the setup. Russia and the DPRK not only have direct communications and a land channel, but they are clearly um, building uh, the beginnings of an, a, a richer economic relationship and possibly a more strategic and security-oriented one in other respects too. Now, I have no doubt that this is happening uh, with the knowledge of the authorities in Beijing. So that's one. The second thing that I think is happening in the DPRK, which I think is important to remember, is that the DPRK now um, is genuinely nuclear capable. Um, now, that is disturbing in many ways, but it's a reality that the sanctions regimes over the various decades have sought to ensure an outcome that didn't happen. It has happened. So that's a reality that we need to be mindful of. Thirdly, the DPRK has abandoned the decades-long policy of reunification. Many observers interpreted that as something quite negative uh, because, it, it, in a sense, it it, it, it painted the um, what is the Republic of Korea as, as an enemy. But it changes things in other ways too, and it's quite subtle because when you've got the baggage, if you will, of this ambition to reunify, that limits the kinds of detente that you could conceivably negotiate. Now, in effect, there is a sliver of space in which a different kind of diplomatic discussion can begin to take place around a stabilised to Korea solution. Now, this isn't going to be something that happens with a click of the fingers. None of these things are easy things to make happen. And often in diplomacy, you only need small shifts in a number of things to create new windows of possibilities and you've got to grasp them so the challenge across the region and again i think that this was a bit of an underlying thread in that trilateral meeting between the rok japan and china is that there's a realization that there's a window of opportunity to reconfigure what a stabilized uh, north asia situation might begin to look like there's no way that this could have happened ironically, without the DPRK becoming nuclear capable. There's no way that it was going to happen without the DPRK in effect having a conduit now to the global economy via Russia. Um, and no way would have happened had the policy of reunification remained in place. So these, these are important but subtle changes in the landscape, which gives me a, a modicum, if you will, of hope, even if it's not optimistic hope, that the wiser heads in the region can approach this window with delicate hands, but with a view to, as you say in this in the communique, with a view to a shared responsibility for stability. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me the same way. I mean, this is one of the things that gives me hope that I that I even hear these positive words coming up because it's not easy to make a joint communique, especially not one that is this long and even touches on some important issues. And what you also read from that is that while Japan would never, I, I mean, at least for the moment, never give up its security relationship with the US because the entire the entire security strategy of, of Japan is built around that. And you have trilateral summits with the Philippines on the one side, it seems and that Japan Japan is continuing something that it has been doing for a long time, which is trying also to build a, a, a separate um, multilateral fora in order to to like uh, uh, build its interests and 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 do that in a pacific way, right? In a, in a pacifist way, in a, in a non-violent way. This is not about this is not about creating more military assets. This is about trying to find leeways to de-escalate. One of the things that the document stresses is the importance of people-to-people -people exchange, right? I mean, we want more people, we want more economics. They were there even. I think it's not in the communique, but but in the press release, they were also talking about the potential in the future to create a free trade agreement. Um, in the communique, it says that they want uh, all three of them uh, uh, reaffirm, of course, the UN Charter. They they uh, want open trade based on the WTO, 
World Trade Organization, yeah. including the dispute resolution mechanism that they want to make functioning again, which is the US, which stands in the way. So this is right. the subcontext here. Um, and one more thing that really surprised me is that they have an article in there that talks about uh, the financial system. Let me read this out for a second. Yep. The three of them, we welcome the progress made in ASEAN plus three finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in particular the endorsement of the establishment of the rapid financing facility with the incorporation of eligible freely usable currencies at its yep. currencies of choice. Yeah, this is very interesting. This is basically this is this is a hidden hint toward de-dollarization and to, toward using mechanisms that do not go through the US and through um, through SWIFT. Yeah, it is. It's a look when you read a lot of these documents as you and I have over the years. Often the headlines that you get in the in the media reporting never touch on these more mechanical components, including you know when Xi Jinping visited uh, Saudi Arabia eighteen months or so ago in very long media coverage. The issues around uh, discussions of using the Shanghai Oil and Gas Exchange was barely touched upon, let alone even more mechanical issues around uh, financial regulatory harmonisation. But this, this, this is a recognition that the stability of the region is impacted by many things, including, of course, the economic situation. And if you wind your mind back to uh, the uh, the 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 98 or thereabouts, 97, 98, uh, with the Asian financial crisis, one of the collective lessons learned across the entire region is the need to have mechanisms that would mitigate and also assist in alleviating any possible liquidity problems that individual countries may have. And those liquidity problems and foreign exchange risks have, uh, were, were historically tied to the exposure that all of these economies had to the United States dollar. Now, since then, a whole raft of institutions have been created by um, the ASEAN plus three that will go towards the stabilization of the financial architecture of the region. And I think that this move towards uh, embracing regional economic intercourse enabled by currencies in the plural of choice is in some ways, an ongoing evolution of addressing these more strategic concerns, but it's also one that grasps the nettle of de-dollarization, or probably a better way of thinking about it, is currency multipolarity. It's not yeah. about rejecting one currency in favour of another. It's actually about systemic change, and it's a systemic change that bolsters national economic sovereignty and minimizes the exposure of national economies to decisions made elsewhere. I think it's a very, very constructive step forward. So this trilateral, even though it was undertaken in the shadow of the US, Japan, Philippines trilateral, um, I think offers a lot of hope that the major players in this part of the world realize that the kinetic first pathway that they've been watching roll out in other parts of the world would be a total disaster for this part of the world. These would be really beautiful uh, final words, but I have one more question on my mind, which is the, um, I also have hope actually in the 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 government of the um, Republic of China, uh, the the the, gov the government um, uh, in Taiwan, um, because they are they have 120 years of competence, right? They they are actually there is a lot of good politicians. Um, on the other hand, they have they they have a whole different set of problems than, like, say, Japan Japan or the, and the Philippines. One of the things of the consensus that has been working for a long time is that um, the de facto situation is is agreed on between the PRC and the uh, and the ROC and between the People's Republic and the Republic of China, and that you know the the People's Republic mainland China is the is the largest trading partner of Taiwan and, and, and the Republic, right? And even the islands of Kinmen and Matsu are official are are well 
I mean, the, the, the mainland China um, does not try to in, invade them or put its soldiers there. They are part of uh, the Republic of China. And uh, despite the, the fact that they're only like five kilometers away, away from Shaman, I mean, it's it's a ridiculously close. But now we have had for the first time like U.S. military personnel that went to these to to Kinmen. And I was I really I was very surprised when I read about that about two months ago, because that's a huge escalation. Um, do you what is your assessment about the internal the internal political situation in the Republic of China in Taiwan? Many observers will point to the electoral success of um, what what has historically been an independence oriented party at the presidential level. Right. But, but what's interesting about electoral systems is that electoral systems have their own rules and winning an election merely means that you've satisfied the rules. Now, the rules in the Taiwanese presidential election is a first-past-the-post um, vote, and you don't need to actually achieve a majority of those who vote to, to be declared the winner. You just have to have more votes than the others. Um, so we have a situation where um, about 60% of the voting population, those who did vote, actually didn't support the Independence Party. And you see that reflected more in the in the yuan, the legislative yuan, where the um, where you've got the the, the parliament the, that's that's the Taiwanese the, parliament, yeah, um, where you've got the parliament that is clearly not dominated at all by by the the party that holds the presidency. So that's the first thing. I think that there's a a fracturing um, domestically. I think the other interesting thing about what's going on around the island is that China, obviously, the mainland, has in recent years. Um, exercise a number of demonstrations of capability. And it's done that after the Nancy Pelosi visit, and it's done that more recently after the speech delivered by um, uh, by uh, Lai Ying, the Lai Qingda. Um, and the, the uh, new, uh, the new uh, uh, president, yeah. And, and those demonstrations of force, I think, really show a few things. One is uh, the ability for the... Uh, People's Liberation Army and all of its facets to move at incredible pace um, to be able to implement what is essentially the foundations of a cordon around the island um, within 72 hours is incredibly fast. Now, you've got to remember that under the framework of One China, the island is viewed as part of the sovereign territory of China. So the ability to... to move and create a protective cordon on the eastern side of the island um, would be seen as a, a as a demonstration of defensive capability. This isn't a demonstration of an ability to, quote, invade Taiwan, unquote. It's a demonstration of an ability to protect Taiwan from others who may seek to interfere in, in its affairs. That's an important point to remember. The other thing I think that's worth remembering about what's going on there is that once again um, the shadow of conflicts that have been happening in other parts of the world not only loom large but also provide living lessons and there isn't a person on either side of the Taiwan Straits that would be looking towards a kinetic resolution of a civil war that has not yet formally concluded. Now we also often hear people talk about the status quo. So American official policy is that they don't support a unilateral change to the status quo. What's debated really, of course, is what the status quo actually entails. Now, the implication of particularly the US view of what the status quo entails is that uh, the island of Taiwan, in effect, gets to continue to conduct itself as a de facto country. That's really what the uh, the US position is increasingly implying. It has undertaken over the last 20 odd years a program of salami slicing the one China policy. It has provided arms to, uh, to the island. It's provided training, etc. Now, uh, the Chinese view of what status quo means is that there is um, a a, a temporarily halted civil war in terms of there being no, uh, you know, arms being fired, uh, but that the the status quo 
also has as part of it a commitment to nonviolent reunification. Mm. That's the status quo. And that was the status quo right through um, the last two decades, that there was an effort towards alignment, interaction, normalisation, with a view that it would lead in some way, shape or form towards peaceful reunification. From the Chinese side, the mainland Chinese side, that's the status quo that the US has been salami slicing and undermining. I keep thinking that all I wish for is that the that the situation remains stable and economically prosperous on both sides for another 30, 40 years, because these conflicts have a tendency of changing. And we see that already over the 70 years that this conflict is raging. The conflict used to be about the, the, the core issue, used to be who is China? Beijing and Taipei both claim to be China, right? That was the original uh, division. Well, also, when Taipei was representing China in the UN, in the, including the Security Council, right? And then that one was resolved in the sense that today nobody in the world would still dream of uh, calling Taipei China. Even even the Taiwanese de-emphasize the their own, you know, the name that they have, the Republic of China. They de-emphasize that. the The conflict has morphed into this problem of. Uh, is Taiwan different from China? Yes or no? So that's a different, that's a very different place to be from. And the thing is, if we can move forward in the next 30 years, the conflict will probably change again. Um, so my big question is just, can we keep it stable long enough in order for a peaceful resolution to emerge? I think that there's a lot of prospects that it will remain peaceful. And that's in some ways a counterintuitive thing to say, when you have so much talk of the impending war over Taiwan. And the reason why I think that there's strong prospects of there not being a military conflict in relation to Taiwan is that neither the mainland nor those on the island have a vested interest in having a war with each other or in reigniting the kinetic aspects of the civil war. There is a commitment given that there are family relationships, you've got to remember there are family relationships that still bind the peoples um, who are, are living on both sides of the Taiwan Straits, um, that, that, there are, that there is a pathway to reunification. Now, what that will look like, what the political settlement looks like, what the institutional arrangements are, well, that's all up for discussion and debate, if you will. And... Uh, you know, I often reflect upon the way that, for instance, Russia dealt with Ukraine over the various decades and how, because of a very pragmatic attitude, it, over the last couple of decades, it was willing to, in a sense, accept a particular set of arrangements that in a different time and place it might not have. And so I think time can do amazing things and that the there is a reservoir of will on both sides of the Taiwan Straits to achieve a resolution that's in the interests of the people that live across that Straits that is peaceful and which importantly delivers for everybody concerned the opportunity to live a life in peace and prosperity. And that is why I think that the chances of a locally instigated conflict are negligible. Well, wow, these are beautiful words to stop, uh, to end the video with. Uh, Warwick Powell, thank you very much for your insights today. Happy to be here again.